It's a great pleasure to, uh, to welcome to Mount Sinai uh, Kyle Stoller from Massachusetts General Hospital. Uh, Kyle is the director of GI, the GI Motility Laboratory, laboratory there. Um, he's a graduate magna cum laude from Bowdoin, a uh, native of New England, Beverly, Mass, and uh, went on to get his MD at Harvard and also his MPH uh, through the clinical effectiveness program there. Uh, and then internal medicine training NGI fellowship all at MGH and now faculty at MGH. Uh, he started out as an instructor about three years ago and this year became an assistant professor. That's how it works at Harvard. You start as an instructor almost uniformly. And uh, he's a very accomplished uh, clinician as well as investigator, focusing on neurogastroenterology. He's won numerous awards as a young investigator from the ANMS and a rising star in IBS from UEG. Um, he has more than 22 original publications, and we're very delighted to welcome him here. Thanks for visiting us, Kyle. Well, thanks, everyone. It's really an honor to be here, um, to come to New York and, and see actually some surprising old friends um, that come by, and, um, and to really talk about a topic that I sure does not generate a lot of enthusiasm <coughs> among most gastroenterologists, but something that I get very excited about, and hopefully I, I want to impart some of that excitement to you guys, because at the minimum, these patients are going to come. And I always say with functional GI disease, you can spend your whole career running away from it, or you can embrace it. But no matter what you do, it will be there. Uh, these are my disclosures. Okay, so before we talk about what is abnormal, what makes someone constipated, we have to talk about what is normal. Um, and I think that's important because many people have very popular beliefs about what is normal, and they're very held to that, right? Constipation is the intersection between actual science and pop culture and GI, right? People are very invested. <laughs> Dr. Oz tells you what your stool should look like, that it should dance in the toilet when it comes out, all of these things that happen. And so we need to tell people, we need to say, what's normal? And so this three-by-three three metric is what's understood, and that's three bowel movements per day or three bowel movements per week. Anywhere in between that is normal, and you can see the histogram here from a relatively recent study from the Red Journal. Now, if we actually look, of course, you know, you had very beautiful endoscopic images. You know, this is the type of beautiful image that I show you in a constipation talk. Beyond in terms of, this is really what I think about when I think of normal, not necessarily frequency, but consistency. Because as we'll talk about, consistency has some correlation with colonic transit time. So when we look at consistency, that sweet spot is really type 4 right here in the middle, that smooth sausage snake. Um, and that really reflects normal colonic transit time. And so you can see the distribution across the U.S. population among those who aren't constipated really does cluster around the middle. But of course, if we look by gender, you can see that there is some variation. And I would say that the majority of normal folks for females kind of range between a 2 and a 5, or rather between a 2 and a 6, and between men more in the 3 to 5, so they're more cl tightly clustered there. So when I talk to patients about what is normal, because you would be surprised, someone is seeing their third or fourth gastroenterologist for what is essentially not constipation, but a belief that they are constipation, it's important to use this type of data to help sort of bolster your argument. Now, officially, we have the Rome criteria. And these shouldn't be surprising for anyone who's ever taken care of a constipated patient or been constipated themselves. Um, hard stool straining, incomplete evacuation, blocked evacuation, manual maneuvers to facilitate defecation, less than three bowel movements per week, and of course, no secondary causes of constipation. And of course, you can't have diarrhea if you're going to be chronically constipated. When we think about constipation, we really think of three subtypes. This is what most people think of, right? Slow transit, things are not moving from point A to point B. Um, of course, the more savvy might think about pelvic floor dysfunction. And then, of course, there's normal transit constipation, which has us really tearing our hair out. I want to focus first on transit because, again, that's what most people, including many physicians, think about when they think about constipation. And I want to get back to some of the basic physiology that's happening here because it's really quite interesting. And many of our laxatives actually currently don't address that need at the moment. So what happens here is you have these enteroendocrine cells, right, these enterochromaffin cells that are sticking up fingers into the lumen, and they're sort of sensing what's going on out there. <coughs> Most importantly, they're sensing pressure. So if you have a bolus coming through, that pressure stimulates those cells. They create serotonin. It's released in vesicles. And then it stimulates these extrinsic afferent nerves, which goes up to the central nervous system, and these intrinsic afferent nerves, which goes into the lining of the colon, or the small bowel in this case. And so now we have this enterochromaffin cell here. 
it's releasing serotonin, it's going up to this afferent neuron, and then proximal to the bolus, so this is the proximal side, you go to an excitatory motor neuron, you release acetylcholine, and you have a contraction, proximally. On the distal side, you go to an inhibitory motor neuron, you release nitrous oxide, and you have inhibition. So you're squeezing on one side, you're relaxing on the other side, and the bolus moves from point A to point B. And that's fundamentally how people peristals, although we have taught, tended to get away from it when we think about constipation. What does this do on sort of a macro scale? Well, this creates these HAPCs, right? These high amplitude propagating complexes or contractions. And they move from one end of the colon to the other in a very rhythmic fashion. And I would be cautious to state that we still don't really understand colonic motility all that well. But we do know that HAPCs are associated with the need to have a bowel movement. And they're also associated with certain physiologic cues. So I tell patients, your colon sleeps while you sleep. And when you wake up, it starts to contract, which is why you have many patients who have a hyperactive morning reflex when they run to the bathroom before they do anything. And then you have patients who are eating a nice dinner and they're running afterwards because you have these contractions that happen after meals as well. Chemical stimulation with a stimulant laxative will create this as well, and that's why they work. And then when you get to the sigmoid, right, these move all the way through, then you actually have the sigmoid which acts as a break and sort of says, hey, this is not a socially convenient time to have a bowel movement. Let's move stuff back into the descending transverse colon to sort of store things for a more appropriate time. So if we wanted to look at transit, how do we measure it? And so the current protocol that most people use is a SITS protocol. And we use the Hinton protocol, which is they ingest a SITS marker pill. There's 24 radio opaque markers. And it's the rule of fives, right? They ingest it on day zero. On day five, they get a plain abdominal film. And you can sort of count how many markers are here. They're very easy to see. One, two, three. You can see they're over five. And so therefore, this patient has slow transit constipation. This is a dichotomy. It's an all or nothing. The amount of it, as far as we know, means nothing. Now, of course, as I mentioned, we get to show the Bristol stool scale yet again, um, that this is a rough surrogate of colonic transit. And I will tell patients this. I'll say, you know, if you're in this middle spot, that's actually a reflection that you're probably having normal colonic transit. Now, that doesn't mean you're not constipated, and we'll talk about that in a moment. But it does mean, at the minimum, maybe we shouldn't be throwing laxatives at you to speed things up. So the way I think of constipation, and I think many others as well, is really a spectrum. So over here on the right, we have pure, isolated, slow colonic transit. You know, these are people who really don't move from point A to point B, but they're not particularly bothered by it. They have very infrequent, maybe hard bowel movements. You know, anyone who's not bothered by constipation, though, in our business is a unicorn, because why are they even showing up in your office? On the other end, we have normal transit constipation, right, which is really probably a surrogate for IBSC and probably a surrogate overall for visceral hypersensitivity. And at the end, obstructed defecation or pelvic floor dysfunction or dyssynergic defecation can play a role in all of these types of physiologies. Yet the patient walks down to their local CVS, or we're in New York, so I'll say Duane Reed, they get laxatives, right? They see all of these laxatives here that they can use, and all of these are really assessing transit, which of course is right for your unicorn patient, but probably is not doing much for many of your other patients. So that brings me, of course, to pelvic floor dysfunction. Um, this is a nice illustration that was from a, a not-so-recent New England Journal article. At rest, you have the pubal rectalis here, and you have your internal and external anal sphincters. This creates this sling, and this makes it very socially appropriate not to lose your bowel contents when you're not meaning to. And then when you bear down and have a bowel movement, this pubal rectalis relaxes, the external and the internal anal sphincters relax, and you push things out. And the analogy that I always tell to patients is imagine you have someone in the room that you don't like and you're trying to push them out the door. Two things have to happen. You have to give them a strong push and the door has to open. If either of those things don't happen together, then likely that person is going to stay in the room with you. So let's talk about anal rectal manometry because it is a much beloved test by people like myself. It is not so much beloved by our patients. Um, but of course, we know that many retained markers are frequently seen in people with pelvic floor dysfunction. So when we're looking at colonic transit, we can't say, well, this is a slow transit. We don't need to assess their pelvic floor because probably around 40% of people are going to have slow transit with pelvic floor dysfunction. The reason? Probably some sort of reflexive slowing of the colon proximally. We don't know. Um, and here are the things. You say, well, I talked to my patient and he or she says, I have painful defecation. I have straining. I have incomplete evacuation, that must mean that there's a pelvic floor issue here. And the truth is that multiple studies have shown that there's no relationship between the symptoms that the patient reports and the presence of physiologic pelvic floor dysfunction 
these symptoms, which I showed you before, are part of the Rome criteria, really just fall into symptoms that people have when they're constipated. Well, what, what do you say? Well, what if I can just get away with just doing a SITS marker study, right? And this is the idea behind it. So you say, well, they're either normal or they have things distributed. This is colonic inertia. This is slow transit. Oh, look, they're all here in the rectum. That must mean that this is pelvic floor dysfunction. I don't have to go through this or difficult to order test. But actually, some of the data from our own institution shows that really there's no correlation between the localization of these markers and the presence of pelvic floor dysfunction. So anal rectal manometry, unfortunately, depending on your perspective, actually comes relatively early in our algorithm for treating constipation. Now, this isn't really realistic because even in a place like New York City, it can be difficult to order anal rectal manometry. Um, there are limited labs that are doing it. Um, and it could be sort of, as you said, difficult to get a patient to go through with it. But theoretically, it should come after a sort of therapeutic trial of regular laxatives before you go down the colonic transit route. So anal rectal manometry has sort of evolved over the years. It started with these complicated water perfusion machines, which were what we were using at MGH when I came there, which was not that long ago. What's nice, though, is that the tracing is very intuitive here. We think back of getting that person out of the room that I didn't like. We have the push here. This is the rectal push. And we have the anus that should be relaxing to allow that person or the door to open to get them out. But now, of course, we have high definition or 3D, right? There's 256 sensors arranged in the anal canal with one sensor in the rectum. And you can actually get beautiful images of the anal canal if you can say there can be such a thing. Um, this is high resolution anal rectal manometry here. So this is the intermediate step, which you also get with 3D. But I show this because this is a good illustration of dyssynergic defecation. Each time this little box is here, this patient is pushing down. Here is a sensor that's in the rectum. These are the sensors that are arrayed across the anus. And you can see they're pushing down here. They have a good rectal pressure. Those warmer colors indicate higher pressure. But then at the same time, they have paradoxical contraction in their anus. And so they're pushing very well, but then the door is staying closed. In fact, not only is it closing, it's moving back and hitting that person in the face as they're trying to get out. And so as, you, as a result, this is very easy to visualize. And if we overlay the 3D technology, this is what we should expect to see in the anal canal as someone pushes. And what actually happens in dyssynergic defecation is you actually see this sort of purse string type shape, which is part of the anatomy of the internal and external anal sphincters. What actually ends up happening is that stool can't get out. You know, you're trying to, if I could in real time turn this, which you can in the software, you could see it would be very hard to get anything out of there. I don't want to get into too much detail here, but pelvic floor physical therapy works. And in fact, it works probably much better than many of the things that we offer our patients on the pharmacologic side. I generally quote patients appropriately selected 60 to 80% chance of improvement. That's much better than what we're seeing, of course, in IBS trials, where we're maybe getting a 12% efficacy rate. Um, does it give us any more information? Um, this was an analysis that we did a little while ago that essentially showed that these high resting anal pressure patients, which doesn't necessarily correspond to any physiology of evacuation, may be a marker of patients who are using higher healthcare resource utilization, including endoscopy, imaging, et cetera. So as Freud said, you know, this uh, anal retentive type may be more than, more than, uh, than meets the eye. Um, the other thing, of course, is that many of our patients come to us with bloating, and we know that patients with IBS are actually very, or much less effective at evacuating gas. Um, and that constipated patients who are bloated are actually more likely to have anal rectal dysfunction than those who are not bloated. So there's been some data that shows that if you send these bloated constipated patients who have dyssynergic defecation for physical therapy, their bloating is likely to get better as well. And of course, anybody who has a panacea for bloating instantly becomes a very popular person because uh, I know all of you are dealing with patients who have bloating and, and of course not dealing very well because there are very limited options. Well, let's talk about people transit, right? What do we do when constipation is at its worst, this refractory constipation? We take their colon out. And so what this data from Medicare shows is that over time, the amount of colectomies in this country is going up. But surprisingly, the percentage of those colectomies that are for chronic constipation is going up as well, right? These are not necessarily colon cancer. These are not uh, IBD resections. These are people who are having it for end-stage constipation. And so what do we do, right? These are the surgical options that are available. This is the most popular right here. This is a total proctocolectomy with an ileorectal anastomosis. You preserve that pelvic floor function because, again, unlike IBD, we don't have to worry about dysplasia. Um, but then the patient goes from a constipation to a diarrhea. 
Um, and then the other option, of course, with someone with significant pelvic floor pathology, we may do an end ileostomy, even temporarily, to see how they do. So these are pretty extreme cases. You can imagine being so constipated that you're willing to get surgery. So about 15% of all colectomies right now are done for chronic constipation in this country. Um, but not as all well, right? You say, well, you know, I got my colon out, but at least my problems are solved. And what ends up happening here is that this is some interesting data that shows these are the amount of ED visits prior to their getting colectomy in the red, and then afterwards in the green. And you can see now the ED visits are going up. The hospitalizations are actually going up, which is expected with post-operative complications. And emergency room visits are happening in about a third of patients who are undergoing colectomy. And when we look and we say, well, what are the causes that they're coming in for? Well, abdominal pain, that makes sense. Um, but then other things as well, migraines, other GI symptoms, back problems, chest pains. And then again, we see some post-operative complications among hospitalizations here. So perhaps really <coughs> the fact that these patients are coming in is a surrogate for well-being, meaning that they're not necessarily cured by taking their colon out. <coughs> so this is an alternative approach. Um, this is the Malone antegrade continent enema. Is, are you guys familiar with that at all? Right? This is the idea of taking the appendix up to the surface and actually using it as a conduit. And then what you do is you actually hook an enema bag up, you plug into your right colon, and you flush yourself out every day. Um, so this has now evolved into a cecostomy where we actually place a hole in the cecum. And this is actually a specialized cecostomy tube where you can actually plug in over here. This is what's on the surface. And this pigtail is in the cecum. And you actually flush yourself every morning, sit on the toilet. It takes about 20 minutes. You clean out your entire colon. You go on with your day. This is what it looks like in real time. Um, you can see the umbilicus here, and it can be done endoscopically, it can be done percutaneously or laparoscopically. Um, this is what we do at MGH. Um, this was actually technology that was done in kids, and, and this is one of those few occasions where we've actually done something that kids were actually the leaders here, and then we took it into the adult side. This is a view of the cecum, the ileocecal valve. You dilate up the tract, you put in initially a Mickey button, and you can see that's the flush actually going in. So that's a mix of water and Miralax that's going directly into the right colon. Um, and some of the data here, you, the data here is that we've had about a 95% success rate. Take that with a grain of salt. That means 95% of the people are using it. They're finding it effective for their constipation. But complications here, and this is in our adult population, is significant. And I would argue since we published this data, it's become more significant. Kids are different than adults, no surprise. We see a lot of people with chronic pain at that incision site where they have that foreign body, um, leakage around the tube, et cetera. So my thinking on this is really that it evolved to be kind of a bridge for colectomy and that some patients really like it to have a couple of years where they feel like they're not willing to go a colectomy, but they're being hospitalized for constipation. It can be very useful. So we've talked about transit. But as I've sort of alluded to, you know, constipation is really more than bowel movement frequency. And in fact, you can see here among the patients that are presenting to MGH with tertiary level constipation, if there is such a thing, um, infrequent bowel movements is not their primary complaint. In fact, the majority of them were complaining of bloating and then incomplete bowel movements after that. And actually, if we look at the physiology, this is the data from our own center, you can see more than a quarter of people didn't have any abnormality at all, yet they were coming to a tertiary care center for constipation. So what's going on here? Are these patients not constipated? Are they crazy, right? That's the knee-jerk response. And this brings us into this biopsychosocial model. And the idea here is that what, the way people present with functional GI disease is much more so than motility. Motility is really one aspect of people's presentation. But in reality, there's so much more going on here. There are early life factors. There are psychosocial factors. There are coping mechanisms, which we know in IBS plays a big role in as to whether someone shows up in your clinic or not. And all of these things affect whether someone is going to come in and present with constipation. So it really brings me to IBS because I see IBS and constipation as really one and the same in many people. So this is the latest definition. This is the Rome 4, the cutting edge of IBS. Um, and essentially, you have to have recurrent abdominal pain with some two out of three of sort of an association with defecation, change in the frequency or change in the form of stool. Note from Rome 3 of the Rome criteria that it used to be abdominal pain or discomfort. Now it's abdominal pain alone, and now it's related to defecation rather than improved with defecation. And of course, for those of us who saw a lot of IBS patients, we always thought of patients like this. We never said, well, it has to be improved with defecation. 
IBS subtypes, again, yet another example of the Bristol stool scale becoming more relevant than just in terms of being on the back of a t-shirt at DDW. Um, you can see these are the people who are in the IBSC category. These are the people that are in the IBSD category. And it's kind of interesting when we look at these two groups of people in terms of quality of life effect on their daily functioning. If we look at IBSD people, in this case in the blue, at the moment that they're having their diarrhea, for example, you're giving grand rounds at Mount Sinai, your IBS kicks in, you're having diarrhea. I would argue that your quality of life is significantly lower at that very moment. But in reality, patients with IBSD are not having diarrhea all the time. They have flares, they have times of the day when symptoms are worse. But when those symptoms are there, their quality of life is in fact the worst. But then if we look at IBSC patients, in fact, their quality of life is much worse than IBSD patients all the time because their symptoms are chronic, right? They're chronically constipated. They're always feeling bloated and it's sort of over the course of the entire day. So their effect on their life is greater, but the spikes are greater in those with IBSD. Psychosocial factors, I think, are very important for us to talk about. Um, we know among comorbid psychiatric, among those coming in with tertiary level complaints to an IBS clinic, that about 50% of people are going to have some comorbid psychiatric disease. And in fact, women with IBS, and then I would therefore say constipation as well, are much more likely to have experienced childhood verbal, sexual, or physical abuse. And this is a topic that's very taboo somewhat in gastroenterology. Um, except that maybe among a group in North Carolina that's been doing a lot of work in this for years. But in reality, if I ask my tertiary level constipation patients about a history of this, many of them get sort of a blank look in their eye for a moment, and then they'll actually say, yes, this has been. There's been some degree of something that happened in their childhood, or believe it or not, in this era of the Me Too, a lot of people who had sexual assault, et cetera, during the college years. And so all of these things do play a role, and this probably leads to maladaptive responses in the enteric and autonomic nervous systems. And so these patients, during time of growth, right, during adolescence when these nervous systems are developing, have some trauma that happens to them, and their nervous system develops abnormally. So there are, of course, central nervous system effects that we need to think about, but I would argue that the autonomic, the peripheral, the enteric nervous system are affected as well such that we see many patients with slow transit constipation who are liable to say, well, this is a patient where it's a physiologic problem. It doesn't matter if there was something that happened to them in the past. But in reality, that probably affects the way that their gut moves as well. And, and as I said, our understanding of colonic motility is still very limited. Um, this has been a research interest of mine, which is looking at disordered eating and constipation in IBS. And I think the same question I said, you ask about abuse, assault, et cetera. You ask patients, did you ever struggle with body image or disordered eating at any point in your lifetime? And of course, you're going to have a high, rate, high rate hit rate in general because many of our patients are younger and many are female, and these are two things that tend to go together. But at the same time, we do see a lot of patients who had a history of anorexia, restricted eating in the past. The majority of them are now in remission. Active anorexics generally do not come into your clinic looking for treatment for constipation. Many patients, though, had a history of anorexia in the past. This leads to changes again in their autonomic peripheral nervous system. And then later on, despite the fact that they're eating quote unquote normally, they continue to have hypervigilance to their abdomen. They continue to be focused. Um, and we know that their abdominal symptoms reinforce some of their restricted eating patterns. And it becomes a chicken or the egg, right? Is this patient coming in? Is this an eating disorder? And that's why they're constipated because they're not eating, right? This old analogy of nothing in, nothing out. Or is it the fact that actually they feel rather sick and if you were feeling as sick as they did, you probably wouldn't eat much either, and you would have abnormal eating patterns as well. So many patients, as I said, have a history of an eating disorder and remission, and I like to think of these patients as permanently hypervigilant to what's going on in their abdomen, right? So they were, at a time, very focused on their body image, what's going on, bloating, et cetera, and that's gone away in the sense that they've often gotten therapy, they've gotten treatment. But then when we go further, um, they continue to have that vigilance. Their sort of nerve pathways have been forever uh, changed, and that creates issues for us when we try and treat them. So let's talk about how sensory signals reach the brain. And I think this is the traditional model. So you see we're inflating a test balloon in the rectosigmoid. Signals are going up through the spinal cord, going up, integrated in the thalamus, and then spread to the cortex where they reach sort of our understanding. But the interesting thing is that there are also descending pathways as well. And so when we think of the patients in the former model here, right, these patients, you know, somewhere along the line, they have this idea of visceral hypersensitivity, right? These signals are abnormally upregulated, 
And I tell patients, I say, it's like there's abnormal telephone wires going to your brain, and your brain is constantly getting signals that is saying, help me, help me, I'm in trouble, I'm bloated, I'm in pain, I'm constipated, etc. But just as important, I would argue, are these descending signals as well. These descending signals that actually go through the amygdala, which is associated with emotion, and actually go down, and they can actually tamp down these abnormal signals. And so many patients, when you ask them, are your symptoms worse with stress, will sheepishly admit yes. And they'll sheepishly admit it because they believe they've been told by society, there's a lot of internal stigma in our IBS patients. They've been told by society, well, if it's related to stress, it's not real. And what I tell patients is that really stress is the volume control for your symptoms. It is never the cause of your symptoms. And that can be very freeing for patients because then they understand that stress actually affects their bowels, but they actually don't have to be ashamed because it's not the cause of their symptoms. They still have a fundamental problem in these neuropathic neurologic signaling, but stress can really decrease the ability to have these descending pathways blunt those types of effects. Um, this is a little bit of a, uh, a diversion, but it's something that I always want to talk about because every patient asks me about probiotics and the microbiome, right? And I know every single one of you, no matter what field you're in, is getting questions about the microbiome. I wanted to sort of say, how can I connect the microbiome to gut motility? Well, here, this is this idea, of, right? These enterochromaffin cells have these fingers that are reaching up and sampling what's going on in the lumen of the gut. And bacteria, what do they do? Well, they create gas. They get a lot of credit for creating gas. But they also create biologically active compounds like short-chain fatty acids, butyrate in particular. Those short-chain fatty acids actually stimulate the enterochromaffin cells and stimulate both the intrinsic and extrinsic uh, modalities that actually lead to peristalsis. And so this is one way that you can tell your patients, yeah, your microbiome does matter. Now when they say, well, what should I do about it? The answer is, I have no idea. You know, Just don't buy something that's you know, $300 a month at Amazon, which is what many of my patients are doing. Um, but again, getting back to neuromodulators here and the idea here of treating people's neuropathic problems in addition to their motility, and this was a, an article, or I should say a, an issue that was in gastroenterology recently from the Rome Working Group, and basically sort of abdicating and laying out what are the different neuromodulators that are out there. Um, and as I said, many patients feel better in terms of transit, right? You've normalized their colonic transit. You give them that ideal Bristol type four stool, yet at the same time, they continue to be miserable. They're still complaining. And so this is where neuromodulators may come in and actually reduce global IBS symptoms and I would argue constipation symptoms, including pain. And the benefit here is treatment of pain, treatment of comorbid both psychological and psychiatric disease, which is of course, as we said, present in many patients. You're able to leverage motility effects. This is more so for the diarrhea folks because many of these anticholinergic agents will actually slow colonic transit. But at least when you prescribe these, you should have an eye toward what colonic transit is. So if you have a patient with slow transit constipation who's complaining of bloating, I see many people who are going to give them a tricyclic antidepressant. Now that's going to work well for neuromodulators, but you're then going to slow colonic transit further. But if I have someone with normal colonic transit, then maybe a tricyclic antidepressant can be important. So you want to use what you know about their motility to really leverage the drug that you're going to be able to use. And I think this is an important point, and this has primarily been in murine models, but also potentially there's been some functional MRI um, models as well that show long-term treatment with neuromodulators changes the way that people perceive their gut and changes the way that their brain is structured. So unlike some of the FDA-approved agents um, that for IBS, et cetera, that you take every day but actually don't necessarily show long-term improvements, here I tell patients, you know, you may be able to be on for 6 to 12 months and actually then come off. And that can be a selling point when you're trying to sell what is labeled as an antidepressant to patients who otherwise are a little bit disappointed because they think their issue is constipation. Now, of course, psychological factors play a role here as well, and it's been shown to improve symptoms in IBS. But the big issue has been a lack of access to therapists. So it doesn't matter if you're in Boston or in New York City, you know, there's no shortage of therapists, but you need qualified therapists who can do cognitive behavioral therapy. That's where the evidence is the best. And they need to be able to do it in a patient with IBS symptoms or somatic symptoms of some type. It can be difficult to find who those providers are. And I tell patients, you know, a therapist is like a puzzle piece. You need to find the right puzzle piece to fit your puzzle piece. A therapist is much worse than no therapist at all. And that person is sort of forever turned off to that experience. I think this is some nice data that um, actually Lori, um, who's not here today, but those of you who know Lori Kiefer, published in Gastroenterology, 
basically showing that a minimal contact cognitive behavioral therapy was in fact just as effective, in fact, in some cases more effective than traditional cognitive behavioral therapy, which was dragging the patients into multiple office visits. And so the protocol, of course, is not yet available for public consumption. Um, but what I think this says is that there's a future here in terms of offering some minimally non-office-based therapies that maybe we can all benefit from. There are other types of uh, psychological therapies as well. At, at Mass General, we use a lot of hypnotherapy. Um, and that's also something that uh, Lori Kiefer has actually been a big proponent of as well. And, you know, contrary to the sort of show hypnotherapy that we've seen in the past, uh, many patients, you know, there's good evidence. I shouldn't say good evidence. There's decent evidence out there. Uh, and hopefully more evidence that we'll be generating as well. So when I see a patient with constipation, I sort of think to myself, what type of patient am I seeing today? Because I think in many ways, you know, Sinai, you have patients who are coming from your immediate neighborhood who are your, they just happen to be constipated. And you also have patients who are coming from very far away who are looking for a tertiary level opinion. And really, when you see these patients, I like to put them into a green light, yellow light, or red light category. So these are my green lights, right? These are patients who primarily have bowel dysfunction. Their problem is a problem of physiology. They tend to be older, a little bit more so than younger, relatively balanced between men and women. They tend not to have other issues like um, comorbid disease in terms of psychosomatic symptoms, et cetera. This is probably the majority of patients that we <coughs> will see with constipation. These are the yellow lights. These are patients who tend to have a balance of some central nervous system pain dysregulation a balance of some motility problems. They're starting to be more heavily female predominant, um, and we're starting to see some greater impact on their healthcare-related quality of life. They're more likely to have work-related disability, et cetera. And of course, these are the patients that are showing up in my clinic in many cases. These are patients who primarily have CNS pain dysregulation. Um, they're women much more so than men. They're younger much more so than older. They have a history of psychological trauma in many cases. They have a variety of other symptoms, right? I call them the ugly stepchildren of the medical subspecialties, right? So what's the ugly stepchild of GI? It's IBS, right? No one wants to see those patients except me, apparently, and Michelle. Um, rheumatology, fibromyalgia, right? OBGYN, chronic pelvic pain, interstitial cystitis, you know, uh, cardiology, atypical chest pain. These patients do cluster. They tend to have a lot of these types of symptoms. And in fact, by treating some of their GI symptoms, you may be helping some of these other symptoms as well because these pathways are very similar to what I showed you. But they often have a very poor healthcare-related quality of life, their activity is restricted, and they have a significant amount of work disability. But this can be a tough sell to patients, right? Because they show up and they want a special opinion on constipation, and you're going to tell them about the brain and the gut and nerve pathways. And so this is kind of how I explain things to patients. I sort of say, okay, we start with slow transit, and people understand this. Things are not moving from point A to point B, and many of your referring doctors think of constipation like this as well. Then we layer in pelvic floor dysfunction. You know, people tend to intuitively understand that because they know of these pelvic floor symptoms. Now, as I mentioned, these pelvic floor symptoms don't correlate with pelvic floor physiology, but we don't have to talk about that. We can use that for buy-in for this. Then we layer in this idea of visceral hypersensitivity, right? Normal gut sensations, all of us are having gut sensations as well, right? I ate a very good muffin, I had a bagel. All those things are happening, but I'm ignoring them, right? They're not really reaching my consciousness. In visceral hypersensitivity, they're being abnormally amplified um, by these peripheral and central nervous functions. And then what I think is sort of say your gauge for stool is off. You know, my father's an engineer. He's not a physician. There's no other physicians in my family. I try and explain to him some of the research work I do about sensitivity in the gut. And he says, so you say your, their poop gauge is off. Is, is that what you're saying? And, and that's exactly what it is. I mean, it's, you know, as only an engineer could say it, is your, your gauge is off. Um, and as a result, you're abnormally sensing what is probably a normal stool burden. And I always say, you know, if we x-rayed all of you, I'm going to assume that you don't have constipation. But if we play the numbers, some of you do have chronic constipation. Um, if we took an x-ray, we would all have stool burden. Radiologists are going to see stool in a KUB on many patients that we do. That's normal, and radiologists are not trained to sort of quantify that. Stay tuned for some data that's going to be coming on stool burden and, and chronic constipation and transit. And then finally, work in the psychiatric overlay, right? And this is where you're able to sort of say to the patient, you know, these factors are not necessarily the cause, but they can be the volume control, and they may have changed how you have developed and how your nervous system has developed. And so when we treat these patients, we think of a three-legged stool, right? One leg, you take away from a three-legged stool, it falls over. And I say the same thing to patients. You need all three legs. 
So you need to address the underlying colonic transit disturbances. What do we use? We use laxatives. Which laxative you use? Well, the drug companies are never going to allow you to compare one laxative to another. That's not in their best interest. So you use whatever works. But don't be surprised if you normalize bowel movements, but the symptoms don't go away. And I think that's all an experience we've had treating constipation patients. Surgery should be utilized very cautiously. Um, we've now developed a protocol at MGH where we treat surgery like an organ transplant, meaning that you have to jump through a variety of hoops. Those hoops include psychological evaluation, physiological evaluation, surgical evaluation, um, and you need to show that you're going to be sort of a responsible steward because otherwise we're going to take that colon out and then someone is going to be stuck holding the bag. And that person is going to be me, right? Because the surgeons are going to be done. It's not a post-operative complication, but the patient is no longer better. And so that's why it was very much in my interest to develop a very strict pathway for people whose colons we take out. Um, treat visceral hypersensitivity and IBS overlay. We've talked about this a lot. We want to use the neuromodulators with an eye toward the motility here. And one thing I didn't mention is that unlike inflammatory bowel disease, well, it's with the exception of Crohn's, of course, but, you know, uh, nerve abnormalities don't respect anatomic boundaries, which means it's very rare that a patient is going to show up with slow transit constipation and the rest of their GI tract is completely fine. When in reality, many of these people will have Rarely esophageal, but a lot of gastric dysmotility, both kinds that we can, mention, we can measure with gastric emptying studies. Small bowel dysmotility, which is really a black box, and that's where we really need a lot of research. You know, we have small bowel follow-throughs, we look through, but in reality, these people have nerve dysfunction, both sensory and motor, throughout their GI tract. And so again, surgery is used cautiously because you may take their colon out, and at the end of the day, they still have small bowel gastric problems. And then consider the effects as the third leg of the stool of psych psychiatric overlay and trauma and introduce the idea of cognitive behavioral therapy after establishing a therapeutic relationship. And I think this goes for all areas of medicine. If the patient likes you and the patient trusts you, then they're much more likely to follow your ideas, even if they are not what they considered that they were going to be get at that time when they came in for the appointment. Um, I think this is the case for all patients, but these patients really need that time up front. And I think they need that time to really explain to them this pathophysiology. So this, you know, drawing that I had on the previous slide, I draw this multiple times every day. Um, not in as much detail here, um, but I show patients this is what we're talking about. This is why we need to use treatments beyond just motility treatments. This is why we may send you for pelvic floor physical therapy. When you take that time to explain things, then patients are often much more willing to try things out, and they're much more tolerant of your failures. And you know, this is a trial and error game when it comes to constipation. There's no good comparative data for our laxatives particularly. So with that, um, I know this isn't as exciting sometimes as uh, therapeutic endoscopy, although I really enjoyed that conference. Um, I want to thank you guys for, value, or for having me here. It's really been an honor. A thank you to my mentors at MGH, Brad Quo and Andy Chan, and the AGA, which is funding my research currently. So happy to take any questions. <laughs> Really great, uh, such a great framework uh, for thinking about these patients and their problems. Thank and you. they are such challenging patients, and we do all see them. It's true. Uh, do you have questions? So that was great. That was really great, actually. Is it someone says, so how, so you moved pretty quickly to anorectomonometry, it would seem to me. Well, when you have a hammer, right? Yeah. Um, you know, I think. Uh, we do use relatively quickly on the tertiary level because I sort of think of pelvic floor dysfunction as an easy win because many patients are referred, they may have even seen several gastroenterologists, but because of lack of either knowledge or available technology, they've never undergone an assessment of their pelvic floor. And I can, you know, there's good data that your rectal exam among an experienced uh, person is actually a very good correlate for anorectal manometry. Um, so if you hone your rectal exam, and I love to you know, look at my rectal exam and compare it to the anal rectal manometry pressures and see how good I am. Um, but if you hone it, you can actually be pretty good. And I, so I do my office exam. I do a very thorough rectal exam. And then if it's really normal, I actually don't send them for anal rectal manometry because I feel comfortable. But if there's any hint of abnormality, then the anal rectal manometry can be the tiebreaker. I think the key, which I didn't mention here, is that anal rectal manometry, right, you put a probe in someone's rear end, um, they bear down, you measure pressures, you measure their ability to relax. But at the end of that, you do what's called a balloon expulsion test, right? A balloon, 50 cc's of saline are placed in the rectum. And then the patient is brought, hopefully, to a private bathroom. 
and they're allowed to expel that balloon and they're timed. Now we say most people will normally expel it in one minute, but all normal people will expel it in two minutes. So anywhere sort of one minute and above, I mean, that's a much more sort of accurate gauge of, of how they are. And so even though we have fancy 3D technology, at the end of the day, the first thing I look at is the balloon expulsion. Sorry. Nice to see you again. <laughs> I was hoping someone would ask that, so it's a perfect question. So what happens with defecography, right? I mean, this is a, you know, this is a nitty-gritty field that I'm in. So we'll have your average, you know, 25-year-old female constipated patient. She shows up. A random stranger puts a radio-opaque dye in her vagina and her rectum. And then she sits on a radio lucent toilet and in front of several people bears down to have a bowel movement. So you can imagine you don't make many friends when you send someone for defecography. Um, and that's one of the reasons that I don't do it a lot because anal rectal manometry, believe it or not, is a little bit more humane. The other reason is that defecography has a tendency to overcall abnormalities. And I think the same um, lesson that we talked about with colectomy for constipation, with defecography, you are going to see so many amazing physiologic processes of which we have no idea what they mean. So you're going to see anal rectal intussusceptions, you're going to be see enteroceles, rectoceles, and many of those people will get operated on. And guess what? Most of those people will not get better when you operate on them. So the people that I think about doing defecography are um, anyone who's had a child, um, and believe it or not, not just vaginal childbirth, unfortunately cesarean section as well does put you at risk for rearrangement of your pelvic organs and less you know, function, things like enteroceles that will really truly obstruct. But in general, if we think about it, we usually do it after someone has failed a course of physical therapy. Only then do we generally get a defecography. The exceptions, of course, are people who have visible prolapse or talk about prolapse. And then also we see a lot of patients, I didn't mention, who are hypermobile. So um, there's been some good data out of uh, London that basically showed in a tertiary GI clinic, about 40% of their patients would qualify as having hypermobile joints. So the Baten score is something that you can calculate relatively easily when you see a patient. And the idea is, well, why do hypermobile joints matter? Well, your enteric nerves sit in this matrix of connective tissue. And there's a thought that these um, connective tissue, when it's abnormal, sends abnormal signals to the enteric nervous system because all of these patients have GI dysfunction. And so when I actually do Baten scores on many of my patients, I'm probably seeing about 40% similarly who are hypermobile. Um, and those people do get defecography because they're hypermobile in their pelvic floor as well, and they tend to have things like enteroceles that may benefit from a surgical repair. You know, it's interesting. I've talked to some of the companies that are making these new Pomoras, right? These are these, you know, pretty effective, pretty safe drugs that are opioid antagonists in the gut alone. Um, I don't see a lot of closet opioid users that I know but, you know, to that question, this is an opioid epidemic. Maybe I should be doing um, a talk screen. on. Um, but in general, I find in the GI side, we tend not to see a lot of people who have opioid-induced constipation, but rather what I would call opioid-exacerbated constipation, meaning they've been constipated. They are these red light people who have a lot of visceral pain. Somewhere along the line, they've made enough noise that someone describes to prescribe them oxycodone, and now they have constipation chronic pain, and they're given an opioid that's now slowing them even further. So I sort of differentiate opioid exacerbated versus opioid induced. The opioid induced, I'm either missing altogether because I'm not doing tox screens. Uh, we do ask, of course. Or in fact, they're probably going elsewhere. And I know from the companies that are making these that a lot of these people are actually showing up and getting treated at pain clinics in primary care as well. A slightly kind of off topic question, which is you know something I see in a lot of IDD patients who actually have healed up their bowel, and they're still having diarrhea. Um, we don't know why. And the, the instinct is to put them on anti-motility agents, like so imodium or lamotil. And many, many patients say, I can't even take just, if I take even just one pill, it stops me up for a day, and I have cramping, so I'd rather live with the diarrhea. So what is going on there? What is that? Well, I think in the same way you're hypervigilant to what's going on in your abdomen, you're hypervigilant for medication side effects as well. And so I, when I think of the patients that I see, you know, if we had the, the blinds here, you know, the Venetian drapes, you're sort of, they're peering through looking for a side effect anytime you give them a medicine. Um, and so there is a hypersensitivity to medications. There's also probably, a, they probably have a therapeutic benefit at a lower level. So I often will use agents, for example, that are available in a liquid form 
so that I can whisper the drug in their ear before actually giving them the traditional dose. So for example, gabapentin, um, very useful for functional dyspepsia in our experience. We'll see how it is for IBS and constipation. The advantage is it's gut neutral, right? It's not gonna slow down or speed up the gut. Um, but what the real advantage is that it's available in a liquid formulation. So instead of giving someone 100 TID, which you might give for diabetic neuropathy, you're able to give someone 25, 50 milligrams QHS. And the latter allows people to build up therapeutic confidence. Um, and so often we'll use very low dose and micro titrate to kind of get the effect that we need. You know, I think of, it's a good question because I think of eating disorder patients as really like alcoholics in many ways in the sense that they may be in remission, but they're never cured, right? They always have this hypervigilance to their abdomen. And so uh, the way I approach it is if they're very close to their eating disorder, which is more rare because anorexics in particular tend not to want to come in and see physicians. So they don't even show up in my office. They're not going to wait for, you know, like your folks here for motility. There's always a wait. Um, the further on the out, they tend to have more prospective. And so you sort of identify and say, well, these are the types of symptoms that tend to feed into some of your restrictive eating behaviors. And so it's important to have a therapist, to have a nutritionist there. Um, the key mistake that I see, at least a mistake in my opinion, the low FODMAP diet is hugely popular. Patients love it because it's dietary, it's not, you know, it's natural, it's not artificial. That's the worst thing you can do for someone with a history of restricted eating. And many young women who previously had an eating disorder, they may not have been asked about it. They come in with IBS and you say, I want you to restrict all of these healthy foods. Um, I want you to cut out, you know, avocado, which everyone seems to eat, um, cherries, you know, a lot of foods that are actually pretty good for you. And that's going to feed into some of that behavior as well. So one easy no-no is dietary interventions are off, even though it will help their bloating, but eventually they'll be back to where they were before. But to your question, I do start earlier with neuromodulators because you know, as my dad says, their gauge is off. In eating disorders, their gauge is way off. Um, and I tend to use a lot of SNRIs in these patients, um, you know, Cymbalta, uh, less than Lefaxine, because I think the uh, norepinephrine effect is much more important than the serotonin effect. And Venlafaxine, you have to hit very high doses before you get the norepinephrine effect. So Cymbalta, um, Lomasopran is another one that's out there, but it's never covered by insurance. So starting that, you know, and starting to kind of retrain their gut to be more normal, but also giving them that awareness that, yeah, your eating disorder, it's not your fault that you're like this. I think that's key because they'll often have some internal shame that they did this to themselves, but at the same time say, yeah, it does play a role and we need to constantly keep that in mind. You know, and, and I have to admit, we sometimes and, and maybe I would say often lose that battle with that group of patients, which is why they're so interesting to research. <laughs> Yeah, I think the, the easy answer is to start with an OIC, and the Pomoras are pretty good, and they're all pretty, they're pretty much the same, no matter which one you use, um, but they're pretty low risk. Um, we actually just completed a trial in spinal surgery patients where we gave Pomoras to people who didn't have chronic opioid-induced constipation, and only one patient got diarrhea. So they're pretty well tolerated. That said, a lot of these patients don't necessarily get better. It may have been your experience when you prescribe them something like naloxagol or, um, or methyl naltrexone. And then you just treat them like a regular constipation patient. Once you're sure that you've treated that opioid effect, you know, the secretagogues, things like that can be useful. But I find that they're less needing of sort of that neuromodulator sensory component. Um, and I think at the end of the day, you know, I think constipation is the greatest thing since sliced bread. I mean, I, I suppose I wouldn't think it's so great if I had it. But um, I think it's fascinating to look into. But, you know, when you compare it in terms of harms, you know, their opioid addiction is prime. So whatever I can do to sort of maintain them on their regimen um, is sort of whatever I'll do. So, you know, any type of MacGyvering that I have to do, I'll do. Um, yeah, 
ability for the long term plan to increase access to intellectual property across the country. It seems like it affects every urban center. Are you volunteering to train them? <laughs> you're, you're welcome to come up and I'll train you, you know. Um, you know, I, I think if maybe probably the best plan and the most cost effective would be to treat GI, teach GI fellows how to do a proper rectal exam and risk stratify people into those who you think have dyssynergia versus those who clearly do not. Because when you, you know, when you do enough, you know, I remember as a first year fellow, right, it's like close your eyes, put it in, put it on the guaya card, get out, right? Um, the more that you do it, the more that you start to see the intricacies of this and, um, and you can actually start to make some good diagnoses. And of course, when a patient's in the lateral position and you're, some stranger has their finger in you and is asking you to bear down, no one is going to do their best performance. Um, but you can at least identify those who are really bad performers. Um, and you can also identify some of those people with hypermobile pelvic floors. So I would say, you know, in New York, yeah, we probably need to increase access to anal rectal manometry. But, you know, many patients are not in urban areas. You know, anorectal manometry is not going to be a cost effective for any group. If we teach people how to do a better rectal exam, a lot of people will be able to then identify these people where it's worth them traveling 100 miles to get this test. Um, and the real, you know, the, the other issue is anorectal manometry is great, but then you identify someone with pelvic floor dysfunction. Where do you send them? And just like with a cognitive behavioral therapist, a pelvic floor physical therapist who doesn't know what they're doing is worse than doing nothing at all. And so I think of anal rectal manometry also as a way of rationing. So there are certain criteria that I make patients, you know, because a lot of people, you know, non-motility docs will refer for an anal rectal manometry. I read the study, and I'm very clear as to which patient should go for PT and which shouldn't. Um, because even in Boston, where we're very lucky to have multiple physical therapists who I respect and know, there's still, you know, an overabundance of patients. Um, and PT is something that once someone buys into, everyone really finds it helpful. Uh, because it's someone spending one-on-one -on -one time with them talking about these types of issues. I think we're going to finish there, and I want to thank you again for... Thank you. Talk.